Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Hope that you're doing well. Welcome back to Brad's Corner of the Cheap Seats, where the seats are still cheap, but the production is improving. Got some better lighting in the background for you guys this week, so you're not staring at my ceiling fan or whatever the case is. Hey, so we're here, obviously, to recap NFL Week 2. Well, Brad, it's uh, Tuesday afternoon, Monday and today, ESPN, NFL Network, and Fox, and everybody else, they've already been doing that. You know, what are we doing here talking about this stuff still? Well, again, because it's my show, and I like to break stuff down in detail a little bit, kind of figure out what happened, what were some surprises, uh, and uh, just my general opinion on week two. So, you know, kick this thing off. Hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, hopefully you find out some stuff that you didn't know. So what we're going to talk about first is just overall NFL defenses and how they are struggling right now. NFL quarterbacks are completing passes at a higher percentage than we've ever seen before. So in week two, we have half of these starting quarterbacks completing over 70% of their passes. Just a few short years ago, that would have been outrageous. It would have been heard of. You would have never thought it was going to happen. You know, only reserved for your Drew Brees, you know, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, those guys that or, you know, the elite of the elite at the quarterback position. Now we got uh, 14 QBs over 70%, and we're not just talking about the guys that are, you know, checking down, you know, every single play. We got guys that are, most of them, uh, averaging over 7.5 yards per attempt while completing 70% of their passes. That's, that's outstanding. That's great quarterback play. But also what it is is the NFL defense is, uh, continuing to, in my opinion, get kind of stuck. They're stuck trying to play behind the rules that they're being governed by, and they're stuck behind what the offenses are getting away with. Like, you know, the, the RPO game continuing to be uh, improved, adjusted, expanded upon. The receivers, you know, getting more leniency from the officials on, you know, pushing off or just these defensive passes interference. Like right now, the norm on third and long is send a tight end or a running back down the seam, hopefully get a mashed up on a linebacker. The linebacker's turned around and the quarterback just throws the ball at the back of the guy's head. It doesn't really matter if the defender is able to do much. What it matters is, is that the receiver is trying to work back towards the ball and he falls down. They're going to call defensive pass interference almost every single time. So not only are your defenders at a disadvantage, but what they're also getting caught in between right now is the packages and the personnel, right? We have these lighter, you know, linebackers and, and coverage guys to try to keep up with these spread out, fast paced offenses. You know, these receivers and tight ends that can get out there and move with speed. And they're also trying to counterbalance the teams that are, you know, still there heavy up front that can run the ball. So, you know, what you saw is those smaller linebackers, you know, get more dominant. And I think some of the teams are now starting to switch back to power run football. And the defenses just are at a disadvantage. They're getting caught in between. Now, it typically takes a couple of years for the NFL to adjust to whatever's, you know, new and great, you know, out there on the offenses. So I don't imagine it's going to take too awful long for them to start getting into a better position. And also it's week two. So they'll get more tape on what the masterminds have come up with in the offseason. And they'll hopefully come up with some better ways to defend it. Uh, but for the offensive people who love, they love scoring, they love high action games, close scoring games, um, you know, because they're just waiting to see who has the ball last to see who's going to win. There's a lot of that going on right now. And I mean a lot. Games coming down to just extra points being missed, uh, last second field goals being missed. Uh, offenses are at a, at a premium right now and, and defenses are, are struggling pretty heavily. Uh, talk about a couple of quarterbacks right now who are pacing uh, the NFL uh, in production, right? So Tom Brady, in two weeks into the season, he's thrown nine touchdown passes. Um, Kyler Murray coming in second with seven touchdown passes through two weeks of play. If that's a pace that continues, you know, we're talking about way surpassing Peyton Manning's 55 touchdown season. Obviously, that's an insane pace that you would have to keep up, but who knows? Their offense is loaded. You know, Kyler Murray gets A.J. Green, uh, Devontae, or Devontae, my bad, DeAndre Hopkins, uh, Christian Kirk, now the rookie Rondale Moore. We know Tom Brady's got every weapon under the sun over there in Tampa Bay. It's not out of the realm of possibility that they have, you know, statistically great uh, record-setting seasons when they have that 17th game in play. So uh, quarterbacks just going absolutely bananas, and, and defenses having issues trying to keep up with them. 
Uh, it looks like the norm right now through two weeks of the season isn't a great game is 300 yards passing. We got guys hitting 400 like it's easy, right? Like 350 uh, plus. Like that's what we're seeing and we're going to be used to now. It's like, I right, 400 yards passing, you know, whatever, big deal. It's still a significant achievement. Um, looking at running backs, you know, like, all right, so we got these quarterbacks going off. We got all these points being scored. So what are the running backs doing? We only had three running backs in week two go over 100 yards. Tony Pollard, who if you didn't, you know, watch the game or see the stats, you wouldn't have guessed that was going to be one. You would have thought it was going to be Zeke Elliott. Uh, you have Dalvin Cook for the Vikings, who know they love to run the ball. That's not a surprise. And Mr. I'm going to run the ball 8 million times a game, 9 billion times a season, Derrick Henry, because that's what Tennessee has to do to have a competent offense, apparently. Those are only three guys that, that crossed the 100-yard threshold. The other guy was Mar Jackson, quarterback. Other guy who got close, 95 yards, Daniel Jones. Those are two quarterbacks. Not we're not talking about running backs. It's two two quarterbacks. That's insane to me. We only got three people across the NFL with 100 yards. We'll see if that trend, you know, starts to to get a little bit more even throughout the NFL season, or if it's just a pass happy league like we've been continuing to go to, pass to win, pass to get ahead, run to close the games out. We'll see what that looks like. Uh, other notes on the NFL this week. These taunting penalties have to slow down. They gotta stop being so ridiculous. And uh, the Browns and Texans game, Jordan Akins is tight end number eighty-eight catches uh, a little out, you know, the tight end six seven yard route, catches it, spins the ball like we've seen hundreds of times. Gets up, spins it on the ground, doesn't say anything in the face of the defender, doesn't even spin the ball in the face of a defender on the ground, just towards the sideline. You know, gives a little flex. Again, not in the defender's face. 15-yard penalty. Tawny. And that was over the entire weekend. Well, Sunday's football is only only time, right, besides Monday. But uh, over the entire course of the games on Sunday, you know, got red zone going along with another game. And we're just seeing these ridiculous penalties. 15 yards, you know, for just celebrating a play uh, or just trying to have a good time on the football field. Like, it's an emotional game. It's a hard-hitting game. Uh, the you know football NFL. Like, let the guys do what they're gonna do. You'll know it when you see it. What taunting looks like. You know, getting them in somebody's face and you know talking mess to them or you know whatever the case is. You know it when you see it. A guy getting up celebrating a play by spinning the football. We've been doing that forever. Like let's let's not go back to the no fun league to where. You know, we're not encouraging celebrations. The game's supposed to be enjoyable. It's supposed to be fun. Uh, you know, one of the, the least fun coaches in the NFL, Bill Belichick, tells his team, hey, if we do something good, go celebrate with your teammates. If we're flagging them for something, something so simple, they're just going to get up and be Barry Sanders, hand the ball to the referee and walk away. Nobody wants to see that, you know, except for apparently the competition committee, which last time I checked only has one player on it. Something to keep in mind. Um, going to kick this off with uh, the Texans versus the Browns. All right. Now, I got to say, I- I'm, I'm impressed by what the Texans have done so far. And, you know, the reason why is it's incredible to me how much better coached they are this year now that Bill O'Brien's gone. Now that the offensive coordinator, Tim Kelly, doesn't have Bill O'Brien telling them what to do. Now that they have a real offensive line coach who knows what he's doing. Um, you know, Levy Smith is not the, the greatest defensive coordinator in the world, in my opinion. But even on the defensive side of the ball, you can tell that they've been coached up. They know what techniques to, to utilize. They know how to get the ball, uh, you know, interceptions and fumbles. They've been doing a great job of that through two weeks of the season. They are technically sound, which has not been the case, you know, over the last four or five seasons that Bill O'Brien was there in control. Um, whole, whole lot of improvement. It's sad that, that Tyrod Taylor, again, you know, in his career, looks like he's doing well, gets hurt. You know, going back the past couple of years, he's with the Chargers. Uh, last season, right before a game, 15 minutes, gets his lung punctured by a doctor, he's out. Justin Herbert takes the field, ball game, right? Uh, rookie of the year, we know how that ended. Doesn't get another opportunity with the Chargers. Before that, he's with the Browns, gets a concussion. Baker Mayfield takes over, we know how that ended. Uh, you know, with the Bills, he got benched for Nathan Peterman for no reason, came back, took him to the playoffs. They didn't keep him. So, you know, over and over, he's showing that he can play, but he gets injured and, you know, somebody else takes his spot. 
probably fortunately for him, that's not a very high possibility with the Texans. Uh, third round pick Davis Mills out of Stanford has only played 11 games in college. Is going to make his first start on Thursday night football against the Panthers, uh, who lead the NFL in every statistical category in defense right now. Low sacks, pass defense, total yards, points, all that. Uh, so it's going to be a rough start for him to try to come in and continue, you know, what they were doing on offense. Uh, and the reason they've been so good on on offense this year is they have been showing concepts to the defense, one formation, running a certain action off of it, and then showing that same look, but doing something completely different, multiple different ways uh, throughout the game. So the defense doesn't know what's coming. They see a look and they think they know what's going to happen, and you're doing a completely different action off of that, what you showed them before. That's how you do um, proper scheming in the NFL right now. Show them what, you know, they think they know what's going on, but really we're doing something else over here. You keep them off balance, and you're able to run a productive offense through shifts, through motions, letting your quarterback ID what the defense is trying to do to him. Is it man? Is it zone? Do I need to check out of this play, or am I good? Those are the things that offensive coordinators, the good ones in the NFL right now, are doing for their, you know, not only their offensive linemen, you know, if it's not the quarterback that's calling out the protections, if it's the center and that particular offense, not every single offense in the NFL has the quarterback setting the protections, calling out the Mike linebacker, uh, you know, calling if a safety is coming or something like that. Um, and another thing when it goes in pro to protections and offenses, when you got the linebacker coming, then that's on the offensive line to pick up or the, the running back, right? When you have um, an unaccounted for blitzer, safety, corner blitz, whatever, that is on the quarterback to account for him and get to his hot route. So that's that's something that probably going to have a lot of problems with Thursday night for the Texans and, and uh, uh, Davis Mills. Some of the same thing that you're seeing with the rookie quarterbacks right now that are that are struggling. Um, before Tyrod Taylor got injured, he was 10 for 11 for 125 yards. Uh, he was absolutely balling out. It was a great game uh, going into halftime. Uh, obviously, after halftime, uh, Tyrod Taylor didn't come back out. Uh, Davis Mills comes out, throws a pick on, I think, his first pass. Uh, Cleveland fired up the running game and kind of went on about their business. Uh, one thing I will say is uh, I think the Browns defense is, has some worries. They really did not get any pressure on Tyrod Taylor or Davis Mills with just their four-man rush, even a five-man rush with Jadavian Clowney, Malik Jackson, and um, the other defensive end that they got over there, uh, Miles Garrett. You, there's no way that that should happen. They should have been harassing the Texans all game, which is what I expected, expected going in. But again, that offensive scheming that they were coming up with um, and just the overall improvement on the offensive line since James Campen has showed up kind of shows you that the Texans definitely are not the worst team in the league this year, which is it's great for them, right? Um, Baker Mayfield, sir, please stop trying to chase down defenders if you throw an interception. Get out of the way. Let your guys do what they need to do. Get to the sideline. If you didn't see the play, uh, Justin Reed picks him off and goes straight at Baker Mayfield because Mayfield's you know, stepping forward trying to make the tackle. And he dislocated Mayfield's shoulder when the, the safety Justin, Justin Reed lowered the boom into him. Um, didn't miss too much. Came off the field. Apparently, they put it back in place in the locker room and sent it back out there. Like, hey, buddy, you're good. Um, we'll see if he's limited this week or if he has any problems uh, going into the next game. Uh, those are the only notes that I had outside of the defense doing a good job forcing turnovers um, and playing sound. You know, at every every position on the football field, they got some. They got quite a few injuries coming up and three very difficult games uh, coming up in the, the next few weeks. Um, their next three games are versus the top three defense in the NFL right now. Not what you want uh, for a rookie quarterback who started 11 games at the collegiate level. So we'll see how that works out for them. Um, moving on to the Cowboys and the Chargers. Uh, kind of a little bit of a wacky game. There's a lot of stuff that I pulled in here stat-wise uh, that I find to be very interesting. Cowboys came in with pretty much the exact opposite play um, style play style of what they did with the Buccaneers. Uh, the Buccaneers, they wanted to throw the ball a whole lot, use the short passing game as an extension of their run game. Worked beautifully. Uh, came in the opposite this week. They got Zach Martin back, and they wanted to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and have Dak be efficient, which he was for the most part. 
Uh, he had one inaccurate throw that caused the interception. Uh, also, spacing was an issue for the wide receivers on that particular play. If you go back and look at it, uh, I think you have CeeDee Lamb cut in front of Amari Cooper, or maybe it was Cedric Wilson going down the seam. And you couldn't really tell who he was throwing the ball to. It looked like he was throwing the ball to the, the guy going to the post, but it could have been the crosser. Not, not really sure, but e either way, is an inaccurate throw that was pretty easy for a pick. But otherwise, Dak was, Dak was efficient, uh, had, a, had a good game. Some big time throws to keep them uh, in the game and consistently um, have a chance to win. Um, defense for the Cowboys is is going to have to be better. They gave up five yards of carry uh, from the the Chargers, which I have no idea why they did not run the ball more. Not a high scoring game. The Chargers didn't get down by more than two scores, um, at least not for very long. They should have ran the ball more. Austin Eckler had nine carries. Like, not not great. Your entire team averaged five yards per carry to include their backup. I think it's Justin Jackson. Um, Keenan Allen killed them anytime that he got the ball. He had four catches for 108 yards. He made them miserable uh, when he did get involved. Uh, also, Justin Herbert, bad pick uh, in the end zone. Uh, probably cost them the game for the most part since it was so close. Um Probably one of the only bad decisions he made the entire game. He was amazing. Same thing as last week. I noted, for whatever reason, the guy has money on third down. There was multiple third and longs where he was able to still pick it up, driving the football. Guy's got an incredible arm. From the far hash to the right sideline, he dropped a dime that was you know a good 40, 40 yards, 50 yards away, like it was nothing. Uh, I see a lot of people that were talking about, you know, why didn't Zeke get the ball more? Why wasn't he more involved? Uh, the carries are pretty pretty much split. So were the snaps for the most part. Uh, Zeke carried the ball 16 times. Tony Pollard carried the ball 13 times. I thought a few times during the game they used Zeke incorrectly against that defense. They try to get him outside on an outside zone running play. Um, you know, that requires somebody who has some speed to be able to put the foot in the ground and, and get up the field or be patient enough to stretch it out and find a hole. And, and Zeke wasn't really doing either one very well. I don't know if it's because Zeke is trying to be so patient with his running style right now, or if he's just seriously lost a good step. Because Tony Pollard looks considerably faster than him. Uh, not only looks, is at this point. Uh, Zeke, 4.4 yards per, per carry average. Tony Pollard with 8.4. Absolutely getting it. And he didn't bump his average up from having, you know, two 30-plus yard carries or anything like that. He was just consistently picking up beautiful yardage. He's a weapon for them right now. Absolute weapon. Um, Mike McCarthy needs to do uh, way better at time management. Towards the end of that game, uh, you know, they're driving, trying to win. There was over 30 seconds on the clock that Mike McCarthy wasted and didn't get any more yardage. Was happy with a 56-yard field goal from a kicker who last week mixed two, two field goals and an extra point. I have no idea how that makes sense. You cannot continue to do that in these close games, or otherwise you're going to lose those close games. That's how this works. Um, no way, shape, or form should they have designed that particular drive that way. There was a couple running plays that they ran, which, hey, fine. If you got enough timeouts, you pick up good yardage, cool. Otherwise, sidelines uh, are your friend, and quick plays to clock it to get the yards that you need. Otherwise, you need to push the ball down the field. Settling for a 56-yard field goal is... Horrible, horrible way to go for me. Um, Raiders and Steelers. Everybody that was talking about the Raiders has a lot of backtracking too, my, myself included. Uh, you know, we're talking bad about the draft picks. Um, you know, who's on the hot seat over there? You know, is it the general manager? Is it John Gruden? Is it both? Word started leaking out that it was going to be the general manager if they didn't do well this year because he was going to take the blame. John Gruden, you know, 10-year contract. He's not going anywhere. Um, those boys are, have been ready to play, and you got to give a lot of credit to Derek Carr. Back-to-back, uh, -back, beautiful performances, throwing the football, accurate, huge, big-time throws down the field, um, You know, not getting scared in the pocket, not making bad decisions with the football, just overall very accurate and, and very, very good. You know, We've seen them get out to 2-0 starts before and then have you know bad second half of the season. I think he did at one point last year, the year before they were six and two, and nothing happened after that. You know, I think Derek Carr has had some injuries that have derailed potential playoff runs for them. 
it looks like right now they're ready to roll. You know, the defensive line is absolutely mauling people, uh, getting after it. Max Crosby, uh, Carl Nassib, and um, and Gakwe just going bananas. Uh, if they can keep playing like that, you know, they just beat the Ravens and the Steelers back to back. Two very tough NFC North teams, you know, or AFC, excuse me. Uh, that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful football. Um, Steelers, if you're wondering what their struggles are right now, is they can't run the ball at all. Historically, last year was one of their worst years ever running the football, and it's even worse this year. I don't know about you, but I know that I, there's a corresponding thing that has a lot to do with this. Mike Munchak leaving is the offensive line coach. As soon as he left, this thing started going downhill. Obviously, they've lost some players. You know, uh, Pouncey retired the center. Uh, you let Alejandro Villanueva go in free agency, sign with uh, the Ravens. You know, pass protection is decent, but their running game is, is absolutely horrendous. The difference in this, this game and what you're probably going to see a majority of this year, quarterbacks that can throw 350-plus um, and handle that Steelers defense are going to win. You know, who can run the ball pretty decently. Why? Because they can't run the ball on the Steelers' side, and Ben, ben does not have the arm and the uh, stamina right now to go throw for 350, 400-plus yards. He's not showing that he's been efficient enough, and he's not just showing that he has the capability to do it right now. Maybe that changes, but even with the offense is going, offense is going crazy in the NFL right now, you are not going to consistently win throwing the ball 45-plus times a game. You might win you know, one or two of those, but you're consistently throughout the year, you're not going to do it. So shout-out to the Raiders for shutting a lot of people up so far. You know, Long season, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, the uh, most interesting game of the week for me is Jameis Winston turning back into a pumpkin, right? The magic dust got waved away. The Panthers came in there and and just waxed them. They played a lot of man coverage, didn't give Jameis anywhere to throw the ball. They pressured the crap out of him. As I just said a few minutes ago, they have the number one statistical defense in the NFL right now. Uh, You know, most points or least points scored, most sacks, pressures, all that stuff. Uh, Jameis Winston and the Saints had a horrendous day. Um, Jameis went back to making his, excuse me, his wild decisions, uh, spun out of the pocket, could have stepped up, had some more time, but instead decided to just float to his left and throw a ball, you know, Mahomes style, halfway parallel to the ground. Horrible decision, got picked off with ease. Those are the type of things that everybody's worried about coming into the season with Jameis Winston. Are you going to get the guy who went 30 for 30 for the first time in the NFL with 30 picks? Are you going to get a guy who you saw in the first game of the season who's controlled following that Sean Payton uh, offensive game plan and doing what he needs to do to execute. If that's going to be the bag that you're going to get out of Jameis Winston for too much longer, if he has another couple games like that, I don't see any reason why um, Sean Payton's like, you know what, Taysom Hill can't be any worse. Let's go with him. Uh, Ravens versus the Chiefs. More crow to eat for me, okay? Especially early on in this game, uh, I was very down on Lamar Jackson. And the reason why is it's not only the beginning of this game. uh, It's multiple times that you've seen it throughout his career. Inconsistencies throwing the football, especially down the field. Uh, Early in that game, he missed a deep, wide-open touchdown, you know, by a good couple yards. And we've seen that over and over. You know, we saw him throw a pick six at Tyron Matthew on one of the first uh, drives of the game. Got Sammy Watkins out here on a little, um, you know, stop route, pivot route, whatever you want to call it. Turns around and slips. And this is before Lamar is even releasing the ball. Lamar thinks he's going to get up in time, but he throws the ball, you know, inside as the receiver's falling down outside. Matthew picks it off easy, takes it back to the end zone. Uh, later on in the game, got two deep safeties on him and throws into double coverage. Again, Tyron Matthew picks it off easily. Bad decisions, and it's looking like it's going to be another one of those games for Lamar Jackson against the Chiefs, uh, that he's just not going to be able to, to, to get it down, be accurate, make the throws that he needs to make. You know, He ended up settling in, taking control of the game, you know, running the ball for over 100 yards, doing what he needed to do to put his team in line to win. Um, you know, they got a little lucky there. The Ravens defense is going to have to be better. The same thing that I talked about last week. You know, I think they're missing Marcus Peters. Uh, they're missing more pass rush. Uh, they're going to have to figure that out. The only reason they won that game is because Charles, uh, I think it's Charles Edwards Hilaire, 
It might be a different first name, so if I messed that up, apologize to you, buddy. But the running back uh, for the Chiefs, they drafted number one overall a year or two ago. Gets the ball punched out. The Ravens recover. They go for it on fourth, fourth down. Mahomes doesn't get a chance to get the ball. Hey, word to the wise, anybody playing the Chiefs, that's how you do it. Fourth and short, late in the game, you go for that. You do not put the ball back in Patrick Mahomes' hands. You'll win the game as long as you got a good offensive play to pick up that short yardage, which put the ball in your best player's hands. You know, Harbaugh from the sidelines, hey, you want to go for this? Hell yeah, I want to go for it. Absolutely. Put the ball in your best player's hands and put them into a position to win. So that entails calling a play that fits the situation. It's a tendency breaker or it's the best play that you got, that you got to call in the moment. Um, outside of that, I really didn't see, you know, too much that was surprising to me. Uh, Brady goes ballistic against the, the, the Falcons. Kind of saw that one coming. Um, Rodgers gets his, you know, revenge game back. Uh, against you know the media and everybody who was so down on him after week one. Uh, throws for four touchdowns, like 90% completion percentage. Had two throws in the game that, you know, Mahomes and Brady have to, you know, be on their game to make. Um, that ball up the seam to Robert Tunyon was pure insanity. You know, the linebacker is in his hip pocket and Tunyon really didn't have to do anything because the throw was so accurate that it literally landed in his elbow in between his chest as he's going upfield for the touchdown. That and that throw to Devontae Adams for 50 yards down the right sideline, you know, is beautiful, the best throws that you're going to see. You know, Rodgers still, all the long talent in the world, one of the best throwers of the football that you're ever going to see out there. So nothing surprised me from, from those two. You know, those guys did what they were supposed to do. Um, and had great football games. Uh, as far as the rest of them, talk about those just briefly. Uh, the Eagles and the 49ers. If you watched our, our armchair quarterback show, I did uh, pick the Eagles because I thought their defensive line was going to be able to um, you know, control the 49ers, and that was a very close game uh, for the majority of the time. Uh, Kyle Shanahan's going to have to figure out if he's going to have Jimmy Garoppolo start the whole season or, or if he's going to turn over to Trey Lance. Garoppolo is still missing, you know, easy throws. They're not even deep shots. They're, you know, crossing routes, missing them high consistently throughout the game, like finishes, you know, with the win. So that's great. But those big time throws against, you know, the better opponents of the NFL are the ones that you have to hit. And right now he's not hitting them. Uh, you know, if he was, games like this probably wouldn't even be close. Um, Jalen Hurts, I thought he was going to play a little bit better. Uh, you know they got there in the, the the red zone after that long touch or long pass down the right sideline. Um, had a chance to score, didn't get it done. Game kind of got away from them after that. Uh, you know, Forty ers ran the ball and were efficient just enough to get out of there with a 17-11 win. Keep an eye on that if uh, Garoppolo is going to improve on the accuracy a little bit. You know, we kind of thought that he was a more accurate guy, and, and the more that we see out of him, the more. You know, it kind of doesn't seem like he's he's that insanely accurate quarterback that we thought that he was. Um, outside of that, you know, good good week two action. Uh, we're going to be opening up like we just talked about a little bit ago on uh, Thursday Night Football with uh, the Panthers and the Texans. We'll see if, if that game's even going to be competitive or not. You know, outside of that, we'll, we'll go into um, the reactions from myself, uh, Jason, uh, and Brian, uh, probably on Thursday night once we were all – have the time to to be able to to sit down and, and have our um, have our weekly show. You know, we'll probably include some other stuff in there. We'll we'll go over actually all the games uh, instead of just picking some of the ones that I thought were were interesting or had some stuff to talk about. Um, last couple notes is you know Kyler Murray. People are talking about him being the MVP MVP race right now. Uh, what a lot of people are not talking about was how close that game was because of the two costly interceptions that he threw and how the defense couldn't stop the Vikings whatsoever. You know, last week we saw the Cardinals go out there and, and stomp the, you know, uh, stomp the tires off the Titans. And this week, exact opposite. They couldn't stop that running game, Dallin Cook or Kirk Cousins. Credit to Kirk Cousins because he actually had a, a pretty, pretty dang good day. Um, the Vikings miss a last second field goal. Seems like that's been their MO for you know, a couple seasons now. Uh, you know, field goals are their boogaboo. So 
Uh, Kyle Murray throws a pick six, and then he throws another bad interception, uh, you know, over the middle. Those are things that he's going to have to clean up. He cannot do those things, especially in close games. Um, J.J. Watt, Chandler Jones, that defense, I don't know where they were at. You know, maybe they were just getting hit side to side uh, with that uh, Kubiak style of offense they're still running up there uh, in Minnesota. So more to, more to keep an eye out on that. You know, was it their corner depth that, that hurt them? Um, I don't know. I have to watch that a little bit more closely, and we'll see if they're going to be you know, one of the top NFC teams or not. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. I'm trying to trim this down, I'm trying to keep it under 30 minutes. You know, we're right at about 31 right now. If you guys got any comments, obviously drop them, you know, under the video, uh, wherever you watch it, if that's on Facebook, YouTube, or, you know, any other medium that we posted at. Um, you know, if you guys like the video, man, hit that like button, you know, subscribe to the channel, you know, share it, get all your friends uh, on there. And, you know, we'll continue to put out content and improve with this thing, you know, as we go along, see what people want to hear, what they don't want to hear, what they find interesting, interesting and what they don't. You know, uh, Brad signing off here. You guys have a great rest of your week. Take care of each other. Be safe.